we are live. Good evening. Welcome to iFocus Glaucoma Module 10th Lecture. Today we have a, a very special lecture, a master class by the master himself, Professor Tinong from SNEC Singapore. He's going to speak to us on primary angle closure glaucoma. I think our residents are very lucky to have the master himself speak on a topic that he has so much worked on. Vanita will introduce Professor Rong, following which he'll uh, start his lecture. Vanita. Thank you so much. Uh, it is indeed a math masterclass by the master personified. Actually, in the uh, international uh, world of ophthalmology and glaucoma, he needs no introduction. But it is my great pleasure to introduce him to our budding ophthalmologists right here who are watching us um, through Facebook, through YouTube and live. Um, at the very outset, I would like to thank him for giving his time. Uh, we really appreciate the fact that he's staying up late to do this. Um, and Team CFS, Center for Sight, warmly welcome him uh, to this masterclass. He is a clinician scientist par excellence. He uh, currently holds several hats, including that of the executive director of the Singapore Eye Research Institute. He's a senior consultant in glaucoma at uh, SNEC. He's the deputy medical director of research there. And he uh, holds a full tenured professorship at uh, the Department of Ophthalmology, the School of Medicine at NUS, as well as he has been con conferred a named chair at the Duke NUS uh, Medical School. He has secured a whopping greater than 20 Singapore million dollars in competitive research grant funding. And he has close to, or perhaps over 600 pu publications include, including in very high impact journals like Nature, Nature Genetics, Lancet, et cetera. He's on the editorial board of seven journals and has been the past president of uh, World Glaucoma Association. He has received numerous awards. And if I start citing each one of them, I think we'll just be doing that. But I would uh, name the last the, the few that he has received. He's received a visionary award. Uh, he's been uh, awarded by the Philippine Glaucoma Society, by the Asia Pacific um, uh, APA, AO, he has received the Robert Rich Award for Excellence and in Innovation. He's uh, received a Singapore Translation, Translational Research Investigate, Investigation Award or the Star Award and the list goes on and on and on. But what is also very well known about him that he's very involved in education of all grades of ophthalmologists and in this capacity we extend our warmest welcome once again and request him to take his master class on primary angle closure glaucoma which is one of his greatest areas of interest interest other than genetics uh, professor tinoff thank you so much uh, vinita can you all hear me yes Okay, so uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Santosh Hanover uh, for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be giving this talk. And I'd like to also say hello to my old friends, uh, Dr. Harsh and Dr. Pradeep. So um, today I'm here in Singapore and as you know, we're in Southeast Asia. And both of those who've never been to Singapore, here some uh, pictures of Singapore. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, we're not so badly hit by COVID, uh, but um, Currently, we have like um, some restrictions in like the restaurants being open closed. So that's a big blow for me. Uh, this is my hospital, the uh, Singapore National Eye Center, is the, the main eye hospital in Singapore. So uh, maybe we'll start off by asking your some of your residents a um, very simple question. Uh, which one is more common, uh, open angle glaucoma or angle closure glaucoma worldwide? Uh, maybe we can ask one of your, your, your what is it? Sanjana, would you like to answer oh. that? You can unmute yourself. Uh, it's PO. Yes. Uh, in, in the worldwide, it's primary open angle glaucoma, which is common. But in Asia, it's primary angle closure glaucoma, which is more common. 
Okay. Okay. Um, actually, you you are right for the first part. It's open ankle glaucoma is more common, but actually, even in Asia, ankle closure glaucoma is not as common as open ankle glaucoma. Okay. So uh, people always have this mis uh, 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 understanding that ankle closure is more common in Asia. Is not open ankle is still more common. You can see all these different studies done in Asia where the open ankle is still more common. But I think if you look at it in terms of the proportion, yes, it, proportionately, we have more ankle closure compared to European populations, but still open ankle glaucoma is still more common in Asia. Okay? And all these studies have, will show you this, have shown this data. How about blindness? Which is doing is more blinding? Open ankle glaucoma or ankle closure glaucoma? And this is a very general question. Uh, Sanjana? Ankle closure glaucoma. Uh, yes, that's true. So in many studies, they've shown that the blindness rates for angle closure is much higher uh, in, than, than um, open angle glaucoma in different population-based surveys. Okay? So the proportion of people who are blind is much higher. Okay? So I, would, I wouldn't, it's very difficult to say it's more blinding, but definitely the proportion of people who are blind is much higher. Next question, what are the different stages of angle closure glaucoma? Uh, who's the next one? Oh, oh, so primary went, angle closure right? suspect. Sorry? Primary First, angle closure, closure suspect, primary then primary angle closure, then primary angle closure glaucoma. Yes, exactly. So the earliest stage is when you just have narrow angles, and they call them primary angle closure suspects. And then when they develop a senique or high pressure, but the optic nerve is still normal, it's called primary angle closure. And then finally, you have the primary angle closure glaucoma where you have the full blown disease, right? Where you have optic nerve damage. Okay, so here we're talking about angle closure glaucoma. It's, uh, as I said, it's an important cause of glaucoma worldwide and affects more than 20 million people. So the first step in the management of angle closure glaucoma, of course, is to do uh, a gonioscopy in order to make the right diagnosis. Because if you don't do gonioscopy, you cannot tell is it open angle or a closed angle. And after you assess that it's closed, if angles are closed, you then have to assess, is it synechial closure or apposition closure, and how much synechial closure there is. And of course, you have to look at the intracranial pressure and of course, the optic nerve damage, how much visual field loss and optic nerve damage. As in any other glaucoma equation, you want to see, stage the severity of the disease. So the conventional management of angle glaucoma actually is to do a laser iridotomy first. And why do we do a laser iridotomy first? Who's next? To equalize the pressure between the posterior and the anterior chamber. Mm. Okay, uh, maybe uh, it's partly right, but why? Why are we treating? Uh, what are we treating? What mechanism are we treating for? With doing a laser arthroscopy, we are making the way for uh, the aqueous from the posterior chamber to anterior chamber. Yes, correct. And why? Uh, why are we doing that? Uh, uh, really? So even if the pressure the gets blocked, exactly. So you you're doing the laser dotomy to overcome pupillary block, okay? And pupillary block is where there's resistance at the level of the pupil. And so aqueous builds up behind the iris and causes the iris to go forward or, or it closes the angle further, right? So when you do an iridotomy, you bypass this pupillary block and open up the angle and flatten the iris. So that's why we do the iridotomy. But not all angles open up after iridotomy. You can see the example above, the angles open up, but in the example below, there's no change, right? So why is it that some angles do not open up? Who's next? If it's a plateau iris, sir. Correct. So as, you, as, you, as we said earlier, the laser iridotomy only treats the pupillary block element and the other mechanisms such as plateau iris, lens induced glaucoma and others. So that's why, in not all angles open up well after a laser iridotomy, okay? And these are some studies have shown which angles remain closed, those who are narrow at baseline, those with a more anterior iris insertion, those with a thicker iris, particularly the peripheral iris, plateau iris, as you mentioned uh, just now, and those with a large lens. So these are other mechanisms of angle closure, which is not, may not be relieved completely by uh, a, a laser iridotomy. And of these factors, the lens is probably the most important factor because it is the major factor in angle closure glaucoma. The lens it occupies a lot of space here. 
behind the iris. And this is the, one of the reasons why you have pupillary block as well, because of the resistance is at the pupil, right? Where the, the iris rubs uh, near the lens. And if you remove the lens, you can see how the, the angle opens up dramatically, right? So currently, when we have a patient with an angle closure glaucoma, a chronic angle closure glaucoma, one of the first questions we ask in terms of management is we ask the question, is there a significant cataract? And if there is a cataract, should we consider removing the cataract first? That means doing a phaco emulsification as a first step procedure. As I said earlier, like look at this example here, look at the lens. The lens is a huge lens and it's got a big lens vault, which is going and charging the energy chamber. There's no point doing a laser ergotomy in such a patient. They need to take out the lens in this patient, right? And even if you do a laser iodotomy, in some cases, as you can see in the example on the left, the angle hardly opens up, and this is because the lens is, is the main component. But if you do the laser, uh, the lens extraction, then you can see how much the angle opens up. Now, after we determine is there a cataract, the next question, of course, is you're going to determine how severe the enclosure glaucoma is. Is it very severe? That means they have uh, a lot of disc damage and visual field loss. In which case, should we consider doing a phaco combined with a trabeculectomy with mitomycin C or, or anti, other antivirals that you use in your practice? So which, which cases should we do a phaco alone and which should we do a combined surgery? And I think probably most people would agree that a phaco alone can be considered in those with mild degrees of angle closure, definitely with mild optic nerve damage, and maybe on one drop or not a maximal tolerated medical therapy. But of course, if you do a FACO alone in very advanced cases, you risk having IOP spike or poor IP control after surgery. So you must always warn the patient that they may need a trabeculectomy subsequently, or you consider doing a combined surgery. So of course, doing a combined surgery, the pros are you remove uh, both the lens as well as you try to re reduce the glaucoma, uh, you know, the, the reliance on medication. And of course, the cons are that you may not, the patient may not need a bleb. In not all cases may need a trabeculectomy. And so these, and they also have higher risk of complications. And if you look at studies comparing FACO versus FACO trabeculectomy, you will see that most studies will show that FACO alone is generally a feasible option for most cases of angiocosia glaucoma, which are medically controlled, or that means not so severe. But for more advanced cases, you may need to do a FACO trabeculectomy. And this is because it has got overall low IOP at all time points, and as well as a fewer need for medications after surgery, but also comes with a risk of higher complications. So what about acute angle closure or acute angle closure uh, uh, crisis? As you can see in the example here, with very high pressures, a fixed a mid dilated pupil corneal edema. Now, have you all seen acute angle closure? Um, who's in the hot seat? Sajana, have you seen acute angle closure? Yes, sir, I have seen. Okay, so how would you manage a patient acute angle closure? So first you make the patient... Management? First you make the patient lie sup supine. And then you start with the uh, intravenous mantol, 20%, 1 to 2 gram per kg. Yeah, and then? And uh, then once the corneal edema comes down, uh, topical IOP lowering agents can be added and a peripheral iodotomy can be done. Very good. So your basic uh, principle of management is to bring the pressure down as quickly as you can so that you can relieve the pupil block that is the main cause of acute angle closure, right? So that's your, as you said. And the consensus in the WGA is that laser PI should be done as soon as feasible and also be performed in the contralateral eye, as you know, okay? So this is the standard treatment of acute angle closure. Now, what about removing the lens for acute angle closure? What do you think? Do you think it's gonna be useful or not? Uh, who's next? Rolika? Ro, Ro, yes, sir. So, um, um, Dr. V, would you like to answer? Dr. V? Uh, Dr. Tanmay, would you like to take that? 
so once uh, if feco is planned i think uh, lpi can be uh, postponed uh, for while if you are planning for feco so then if feco relieves the pressure then may not require lpi yes so a feco is an alternative to a lpi especially for those patients who have a bit of cataract right and actually we have there's been two big uh, two studies that compared feco versus lpi for acute ankle closure and there is one from hong kong and one from singapore and both studies they recruited people with some cataract like at least 69 or worse okay? and you can see the hong kong study if you they they followed up the patients here uh, for uh, i think it's 18 months and you can see that the feco group did a lot better most almost nobody needed medications after uh, feco for acute enclosure compared to almost 50% needed medications in the lpi group okay so this was about 15 times the difference in the hazards ratio and the singapore study also had very similar findings almost uh, nobody needed medications in the fago group compared to about 40% needing medications in the uh, lpi group okay so an alternative to doing an lpi in those patients with acute ankle closure after the tech is broken is to do a fago emulsification okay now the question is when should you do it and we, we in the in both studies they were did they did it in quite early on like within a few days of presentation but right now probably we we would tend to wait for a while and let the eye quieten down before we do a fago but it, the studies have shown that early lens extraction is probably a good treatment for cases of acute ankle closure because you remove the lens component and you will probably have a better long term outcome overall for after acute ankle closure now let's move on to another a question about patients who have cataract and a lot of stenting care but very mild ankle closure glaucoma should we consider doing something called a phaco gsl or gonio sanica lysis okay and in singapore we use something called a mori lens because it's a very useful lens we don't need to tilt the microscope and here what is here's what i mean by gonio sanica lysis okay and here after we remove the the the, the, the lens in a standard phaco we leave the visco elastic in the eye then here we put in the the mori lens here and here you can see here without tilting the microscope you just have to, you can just look at the angle uh, structures here and you can see here we're zooming in into the areas where sanica is present and then we put in a spatula and here we are gently pulling or tugging on the peripheral iris to break the peripheral anterior sanica this is called gonio sanica lysis okay now There have been many studies that look at the role of gonio sanica, and most of them show that it's very good results. But we 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 did a recent trial comparing phaco versus phaco GSL in patients with uh, acute uh, with a ankle closure glaucoma with PS and cataract. And what we found was a bit surprising. Okay, firstly, we found that the success rates of um, overall was very good in both phaco alone. as well as in the phaco gsl group okay complete success and qualified success overall was extremely good okay and in terms of iop lowering the phaco alone group did as well as the phaco gsl group okay and so this was a bit surprising because we thought that the phaco gsl group would do much better but we found actually that the phaco alone was pretty uh, impressive okay and at least at the one year outcomes there was no difference between phaco and phaco gsl and recent and also uh, last year uh, the group from uh, aims from tanujara also published another trial which also found very similar results that phaco and phaco gsl are almost similar so perhaps we are you know anatomically we may be breaking the sanica and we feel very good about it because you know it looks good we break the sanica but you know perhaps the sanica uh, if they are long standing even after you break it it may not be functioning well so anatomically it may be good but functionally it may not be effective and so we really question whether we should be doing a uh, phaco gsl but certainly we think that uh, one group who may benefit are people who had a recent attack of acute ankle closure and in those people where you definitely find sanica after as a consequence of the acute attack they may be a good candidate for phaco gsl but those with chronic ankle closure glaucoma where very long standing they may not be such a good candidate okay now let's move on to the the controversy of whether we should do a clear lens extraction 
for ankylosing glaucoma patients who do not have a significant cataract. So this is an example, 55-year-old lady with newly diagnosed ankylosing glaucoma with 360 degrees of closed angles, three clock hours of PAS, cup tissue ratio of 0.8, IOP of 24, 6-6 six, six vision, okay? What would you do? Shall we ask one of the hot seat? LPI. Okay, good. Yes, I agree with you. Most people will do it LPI. And so the question of lens extraction and extraction is probably a very controversial here. There have been many studies that looked at clear lens extraction, but let me share with you the EAGLE study, which was a recent large randomized controlled trial. So the EAGLE study basically wanted to know if clear lens extraction could result in better quality of life, as well as better IOP control and less need for glaucoma surgery at three years compared to the standard of care, which was LPI. Okay? And they did a multi-center study recruiting 50 patients who are 50 years or older, either newly diagnosed PAC with higher P more than 30 or with PACG. And they randomized to either clear lens extraction or standard of care. And in this trial, Clear lens, a clear lens was defined as patients having no symptoms or no visual symptoms. Okay, so they may have had some degree of cataract, but they didn't have any visual symptoms. And the main outcome measure was the patient-related uh, uh, health status or the quality of life. And secondary uh, outcome measure was the intraocular pressure. So in this trial, uh, over uh, 400 patients were recruited. They found the main outcome measure was much better in the FACO group compared to the uh, clear lens extraction group compared to the LPI group. In terms of IP lowering, only one millimeter better, so slightly better, but definitely there was less need for glaucoma medications as well as less need for glaucoma surgery in the clear lens extraction group. In the subgroup analysis, they also found a better uh, health um, uh, effectiveness or cost effectiveness of doing an early FACO in these patients. So they, they concluded that clear lens extraction was superior than LPI and center of care in terms of patient-related health status and IP control, as well as cost effectiveness. And you can consider clear lens extraction for the initial treatment of angle closure glaucoma. Now, of course, there are some issues with Eagle trial, particularly these, many of them were not truly clear lenses. They just didn't have any visual symptoms. And most of them were very milder cases, a lot of PAC and not much severe PACG. Of course, there were many experienced surgeons and finally, you know, it was difficult to translate this better quality of life in terms of how do you describe it to your patient, okay? But certainly the EAGLE trial has shown some evidence for a good, uh, for clear lens extraction and perhaps a trend towards earlier lens extraction. But certainly, at least in our practice in Singapore, we do not advocate doing a clear lens extraction, but we, as we think it's a very aggressive approach. But certainly, we will discuss the options with the patient, and we tend not to do the clear action, but we tell the patient that this is an option. But most patients who don't have cataract will probably not go for this option. They will probably go for LPI as the first line treatment. And later on, when they develop early cataract, then they go for early lens extraction rather than a clear lens extraction. And one of the reasons why we are more conservative is because there are some difficulties of doing phaco emulsification in angle closure eyes. As you know, these are difficult cataracts. Many of them have shallow anterior chamber, big lenses. They could be poor visualization of the, of the capsule, or serial capsule. There could be a uh, risk of endothelial damage, a corneal decompensation, supracoronal hemorrhage. A lot of possible complications can occur. And so certainly we would not recommend it for novice or junior surgeons and we definitely leave it for the experienced surgeons to do a clear lens extraction. So even, uh, you know, so in our practice, we certainly do not do clear lens extraction for angle closure. So I'd just like to discuss this topic. Now, let's move on to the group of patients of angle closure glaucoma who do not have any cataract, as I mentioned earlier, who do have or a very mild cataract or who are unwilling to undergo cataract surgery. And as you mentioned earlier, the treatment of first line is, of course, a laser iodotomy. Okay? However, if you do a laser iodotomy for chronic angle closure glaucoma, many studies have shown that you often need to add medical treatment on, on subsequent follow-up, or they may require further surgery. So it's not a one-off laser and discharge the patient. So you have to tell the patient, 
if you do a laser PI for angle closure, cardiac angle closure glaucoma, this is only the first step. And subsequently, you will need to be followed up. They may need medications or you may need surgery as well in the future. Okay? And so this has to be emphasized to the patient. Many patients think that, oh, I've done the laser. That's it. You know, I, can, I don't have to come back anymore. And they think they don't have to come for any more follow-up. So we need to do the monitored IOP to redo our gonioscopy on a regular basis. And of course, as I said earlier, consider early cataract surgery if you develop a cataract. And of course, monitor for development of or progression of angle closure glaucoma. Now, remember, laser arotomy only treats the pupil block element. Okay? And what about if you do the laser arotomy and the IOP is still high? So what is the next step? Okay? So normally, of course, we would start medical treatment for chronic ankle closure glaucoma with high IOP after laser arotomy. And studies have shown that prostaglin analogs are, like in open angle glaucoma, the most efficacious medications for even for chronic ankle closure glaucoma. So this trial, which looked, compared latanoprost with timolol back in almost uh, 20 years ago, showed latanoprost had IOP lowering of 8 millimeters of mercury compared to timolol of 5. So it was much superior. And studies have also shown the same for travoprost as well as for bimetoprost. So it's, it's common. All prostaglandin analogs can be used for chronic ankle closure glaucoma post LPI with high IOP. Now, what about SLT? Can you consider SLT if the angles have opened up but the IOP is still high? So these are a, a, a common scenario. You do LPI, angles have opened up to some extent, but the pressure is still high. And here's an example here where you can see, obviously, the trapezoidal mesh is visible, but the I, IOP is still high. Should we perform an SLT as, just like we do in open angle glaucoma? And so we did a study uh, you know, about five years ago where we recruited patients post LPI with open angles of at least 180 degrees in high pressures, and we randomized patients to SLT versus prostaglandin analogs. And what we found was that the IOP lowering was about similar in both groups, quite not as great as we expected, around four minutes of mercury, and about 15% change from baseline. But overall, there were 22% in SLT group which did not respond to the SLT. Okay? And this is just like an open angle glaucoma, as you know, there's a certain proportion of people who do not respond to SLT. And just like an open angle glaucoma, an angle closure glaucoma too, we had about 20% people who did not respond to SLT. So this is probably the reason why overall SLT did not do as well. So probably we would conclude that SLT can be considered, especially in eyes which have opened up, and, but the IOP lowering and the percentage IOP lowering is very similar to that of prostaglandin analogs. And but remember, about 20% of cases may not respond. And even those who responded, some of them required repeat laser as well. Now let's move on to another scenario, post-LPI, but the angles are still closed. That means your LPI, remember the group that we mentioned earlier, didn't do anything to open up the angles. What should we do next? Okay. So I would divide this scenario into people whose pressures are controlled and people whose pressures are not controlled. Now, if the angles are still closed appositionally or cynically, and the IP is not high, I would probably just monitor the patient okay, and not do anything. But if the IP is high, we have two options here. Should you do uh, add medications, which, we, which is probably a standard, which most people would do, or should we try to do an iridoplasty? Okay? So this is an example, of in, not for cynical closure, for only for apposition closure. So because what is iridoplasty? So iridoplasty is a laser procedure where you use slow, long duration, wide, uh, wide uh, spot size, low power uh, burns to the peripheral iris to cause flattening of the peripheral iris so that you create opening of the angle. So this is a patient, very useful for patients with toe iris, as well as those with appositional closure as you can see in the example here with appositional closure. And so we did a trial recently where we compared 
uh, laser autoplasty versus prostaglandin analogs for people with post LPI persistent apposition closure and high IOP. And this is what it looks like after the autoplasty. You can see here, they are quite large burns and spaced out over 360 degrees. And what we found firstly, was that iridoplasty works well anatomically. After you do iridoplasty, the angle opens up very nicely. Okay. However, if you look at the IOP change, it was not as great as doing adding a prostaglandin analog. As you can see here, the about 90% change compared to about 25% with the prostaglandin analogs. So it's probably effective to some extent, at least in opening up the angle anatomically and has some IP lowering, but perhaps not as good as a cross-secondary analog. So maybe if you do an autoplasty, you may still need to add medications if, because the pressure may not come down adequately. Okay? But remember, autoplasty has risk of complications. In particular, you worry about corneal endothelial damage. So somebody who's not experienced autoplasty, you may blast the endothelium 360 degrees because your laser is too close to the cornea endothelium. Also, you may get pressure spikes, you may get inflammation, and also you get some pupil disturbance. There could be other complications, and some people have even reported worsening or, or establishment of PAS. So these are complications related to arthroplasty. So, so certainly in our practice, we don't normally do arthroplasty unless we have a plateau iris case with clear apposition, and then we would try an arthroplasty. Now, the last part of my talk is on the management of patients with PACS or asymptomatic narrow angles, okay? Now, remember, we mentioned to you that there are three stages of angle closure disease and the prevalence of PACS or narrow angles can be as high as six to 10% in some populations, like in Chinese populations, is as high as six to 10%. But the prevalence of angle closure glaucoma is only about 1% to 2% in most Asian populations. So it just shows that the majority of people with PACS do not actually progress to PACG. Now, some do, but most do not progress. And in the, in the past, the data on the progression rate was very limited. And the estimate in the past was maybe about 20 to 30% may progress from suspects to PAC. And this was the Velo study. And from PSC to PACG, maybe about another 20, 30% over five years. So this is a very gross estimate and with very limited data. And so there's a big question as, in, in the past as to whether should we be doing uh, LPI for all PACS and what is the risk of just observation? Also, who are those at risk of progression? Okay, so that's why we did this trial called the ZAP trial. So actually, we did two trials, one in Singapore and one in China. And we started the trial, actually Singapore started first, and it was our trial called the Analyst trial, which I'll talk about in a while. But you know, in Singapore, we are so hopeless in recruitment. We took like almost four years or five years to recruit like 500 patients. And so we asked uh, Ming Gong He in China whether he wanted to do the sister trial in China. And in six months or nine months, they recruited 1,000 patients. So this shows you the power of China in getting organized when you're doing clinical trials. Okay? I don't know whether it'll be the same in India, but certainly for us, we were shocked at how fast they could recruit patients in China. And so this trial was basically a, a laser autotomy trial. We recruited patients with bilateral narrow angles and randomized one eye underwent LPI and the other eye no treatment or just observation, followed up for six years. So this is the trial, a very simple protocol. And the primary outcome was the incidence of primary ankle closure defined as high pressure above 24 or two occasions, or the development of sinicare, peripheral anterior sinicare of at least one clock hour, or acute ankle closure episode. So this is the primary outcome measure, okay? And so in the ZEP trial, they recruited about 900 patients, and the overall progression rate was very low, okay? The so-called incidence of uh, primary enclosure was 4.19 per 1,000 eye years in the laser PII's versus 7.97 per 1,000 eye years in the control eye. So what does that mean in raw numbers? 2% in the LPI group versus 
4% in the observation group. So it's about 50% reduction if we do an LPI. So this was very surprising. Remember, the Veloi study had an uh, estimate of 20 to 30% progression. But here they found only 4% progression if you did nothing, okay? And as I said earlier, the, the hazard ratio or the risk reduction was about 50% if you did the LPI. And, and the LPI was, of course, um, generally safe with very few adverse events identified. But the, and the, remember, the end point of the trial was the development of PAC. And it wasn't PACG, it was just PAC, which by itself is not blinding. Of course, if you leave PAC long enough, they do get risk of blindness. But most of the patients who developed PAC had almost no visual field loss at all. Okay? But whatever it is, it shows you that the risk of leaving doing nothing is actually quite low. And certainly on a large population of program level, we would definitely not advocate doing mass screening for angle closure followed by laser arterial. So initially, before the trial started, we thought, you know, we would propose mass screening for angle closure in China and getting all these people who are picked up with angle closure to go for LPI. And this, the trial was to show evidence for, 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 for this program. But after the trial, of course, we said, no, definitely not. We would not recommend community-based screening and followed by a laser iridotomy. It's not recommended. Now, the ZAP trial, as you know, uh, was in China. And so it may not apply to your population. And also the ZAP trial was a slightly younger population around the age of 58 or 59 years, the mean age. So these were people, if you remember, who were asynchronic narrow angles and they didn't have much cataract. And this intentionally so. Those who have cataract, we are not really that interested to answer this question because if those who have cataract should undergo cataract extraction, as I mentioned earlier, okay? So this is the group with a very mild cataract, almost no cataract, and this is the trial was designed to answer this question. Finally, of course, the ZAP trial was recruited from a community setting in China and Guangzhou, and so these were not hospital patients. So let's move on to the Singapore trial, and this is about, it's, a, it's currently in revision in ophthalmology. And in Singapore trial, we found a much higher progression rate 10% progressed in the observation group versus about 5% in the LPI group. Again, LPI reduced risk by about half, okay? And again, most of those who progressed developed PAC. There was very few people who developed acute attack or angle closure glaucoma, okay? So our results were slightly higher than the China's trial. Okay, we were about 10%. But whatever it is, it was still much lower than what we estimated initially, which was 20 to 30%. And you know the reason the difference could be of, in Singapore we recruited patients from the hospital setting, so they were, perhaps could be a slightly more uh, severe case compared to the community. Okay, so this is one of the big differences between uh, Singapore and China. But how has this ZAP in the Singapore analysis trial affects our management of PACS? Well, firstly, I would say that it provides good evidence. Of, of the low risk of observing people with PACS. And it raises the question of whether we are over-treating PACS by recommending LPI for all patients with PACS. And certainly, uh, right now, you know, I see a patient with PACS, I would, I would discuss the option of observation versus LPI. I will explain to them the two options and show the data from Singapore and China and say that if you do nothing, you, the risk of progression maybe is about 10% over five years. This is a Singapore study, as you know. And if you do, if you do the LPI, the risk significantly reduces by about half, okay? And let the patient decide whether to do an LPI or not, okay? So I wouldn't say, I will recommend it, of course, but I will give them the option to decide, okay? Now, who should go for LPI? Okay, certainly patients who have symptoms or they seem to have intermittent attacks, like they have intermittent eye pain, headache, or, you know, uh, you know halos, et cetera, should, we definitely should consider an LPI. Patients who require regular pupil dilation, for example, those with diabetes, diabetic retinopathy, AMD, and other retinal conditions should go for LPI. Perhaps patients who have poor access or are unable to come for follow-up. And finally, Certainly, I would consider family history of angle closure glaucoma, especially if they have 
blind relatives, Rankin Koshi Kakoma, I would also consider an, an LPI. And remember, don't forget, of course, the fellow eyes or PAC, PAC, APAC, who may be PACS, those, of course, should undergo uh, LPI. But certainly, for the rest, we can give them an option of observation. Okay? And if, what if the patient asks you, oh, doc, can you decide for me? Okay. So when they ask, when they say that kind of thing, usually, you know, they probably don't understand uh, the issue. And I would tend to err towards an LPI because in some, in some patients, they, they, if they don't understand, you know, and they come back with an acute attack or a chronic ecological coma, they could, they could be, you know, there could be some medical legal implications, etc. So because they don't really understand, okay? but otherwise, if they understand, you should certainly document the notes that patients understand um, the optional observation and the risk associated with observation. Of course, we will of course warn them if they have symptoms of acute angle culture, if they get an attack, to come back to the hospital as quickly as possible. Okay, so in summary, I have given you an overview today of um, recent developments in angle culture coma, particularly we've discussed with following issues, okay? Management of chronic angle culture coma, particularly the role of lens extraction, and particularly right now, as I told you earlier, the first question we look at is whether they have a significant cataract, and then we consider, should you take out the cataract first, even before doing, uh, rather than doing an LPI? And if they are doing a cataract, should you consider a FACO alone or a FACO trachectomy for more severe cases? We discussed to you the role of corneal senical lysis, and it was a slightly disappointing result from our, of our trial, as well as from Tanush Dada. And it shows you perhaps that FACO GSL is probably not that useful for chronic ankle closure coma of long-standing duration, but perhaps those with a recent acute attack and developed senicia, this could be a good option. We've shown, we've discussed the, the role of LPI and subsequently, how do you reduce IOP after the LPI and pressure cell high using prostaglandin analogs at the first line? We've discussed the role of SLT in cases of angle closure post LPI in which the angles have opened up, but the IOP is still high. And also we've discussed the role of iodoplasty in patients with persistent apposition closure post LPI and who have high pressures, and whether you want to do an iodoplasty, and as well as a role of uh, iodoplasty in, in people with plateau iris. And finally, we discussed the management of patients with PACS. How do we do, how should we manage PACS with PACS in terms of the counseling and the data that's shown from the ZAP trial and Singapore trial, to showing you the low risk of progression of, in terms of observation and the optional observation, and how do you counsel patients with bilateral PACS? So certainly, I think if you don't remember anything else, remember the lens extrusion should be considered as a treatment option in all eyes of angle closure glaucoma, particularly those with cataract. And depending on the magnitude of IOP reductions required, it may be, as I said, with for severe cases, it may be combined with the spectacular procedure. Now remember, lens extraction angle closure eyes are technically challenging with risk of complications. And certainly, if you are not an experienced phaco surgeon, you should be very careful about doing clear lens extraction, particularly clear lens extraction. And this is because they, these could be very complicated and you may end up with a much worse situation than the patient before the surgery. Okay, so thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ong. That was so sublime. I mean, such a complex issue of primary angle closure disease, and you simplified it for all of us um, in you know, uh, 40, 45 minutes, maybe less than that. We really appreciate this. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, I also have a few burning questions, but I would invite uh, Dr. Harsh and Prateep uh, with their reactions, and then we'll move on to the questions, if you don't mind taking them. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I think this was really like, I think Vanita just said it, it was sublime. Simplicity and uh, sweetness. It was, it was so clear. Everything was made so clear for the PGs. I was worried. A man of your stature may not be able to come down to basics, but that was so beautifully done. So for the PGs, I just want to reiterate, he, he really put a trap for you there that ACG is still not the commoner glaucoma. If you get all the glaucomas, 
maybe around 30% of those glaucomas would be angle closure, but open angle will be more commoner. You all have to buy a gonioscope. Why? Because though he said that, yes, PI may not help, but the fact is that you will have to determine whether it's a primary angle closure glaucoma because you'll have to decide whether you have to do a peripheral iridotomy and you have understood that the blinding is almost three times more in these cases. So you have to be extremely careful. Be also careful, and like he has very clearly explained to you, whether it's a pupillary block, whether it's a lens mechanism, whether it's a plateau iris, and many a times it's a actually a, it's a mixture of all the three things, and you have to see which element. Obviously, we do a peripheral iridotomy, take care of the uh, pupillary block first and then go on to the other things. And definitely if the lens is slightest cataract, one would love to do a cataract initially. Again, uh, uh, like uh, we have to uh, ask him certain things. So, uh, but in the patients in which uh, you were thinking that whether it's a primary angle closure suspect and would you go ahead? So I would possibly add a one-eyed patient over there. He had already told you patients who may not be able to come back. And then uh, we, I would love to ask him, there is a paper by Tin himself, whether a prone darkroom test or the uh, OCT, anterior segment OCT with variable uh, measurements, would these two things help him to decide whether to go in so that we will ask him. Uh, and also, uh, some, though we now know that PG analogs are the finest, this thing, if you look at the uh, pamphlet of any of the PG analogs, they only say they are, they, are, they are there for open angle and ocular hypertension. But I think the overall thing was absolutely marvelous. Prateep, please go ahead. Yeah, Ten, thank you very much. It was a very rich lecture and, you know, we learned a lot. So, for all PGs, yes, the diagnosis of angle closure glaucoma, as Harsh also has emphasized, is, is very, very critical. And uh, the treatment, again, you know, I would say the same thing, that it's a very enigmatic disease and uh, uh, you really still don't know uh, that what would work for your patient. Uh, so, most of the patient, you do the PI, uh, in the primary angle closure suspect and uh, you just relax that, okay, you have done your job and you said that to the patient that, okay, there is very high probability that you will not develop. But now you know for sure that, you know, uh, in spite of the PI, they may progress uh, to the angle closure disease and which patient would progress that you don't know. So it is very, very critical for all of your patient uh, to whom you have diagnosed as an angle closure glaucoma or an angle closure suspect to do the follow-up uh, very regularly. And if you feel that the patient would last for the follow-up, then also the LPI is not the answer. Uh, then also probably you have to uh, motivate the patient to come to you for a regular follow-up because it's a, a, it's a uh, blinding disease and uh, the incidence of the blindness is much, much more with the angle closure disease as compared to the primary uh, open angle glaucoma. Surgical part, yes, uh, the clear lens extraction, we don't do much uh, clear lens extraction. I don't think that I have done any, but uh, still, you know, I'm open for those patients who have a very high hyperopia and uh, willing to go for the clear lens extraction. So that could be one of the indication it would serve two purposes, you know, it will take care of the angle closure disease and also the refractive error. So, but still, you know, we have to look uh, into the details of that. And uh, re regarding the synucleolysis, you know, we have done the synucleolysis in, uh, in some of the patients, but I don't know whether mechanically we endure the trabecular network while we are doing synucleolysis or they are already damaged because of the synucleolysis formation, but it doesn't work at least in my hand. So, but uh, Tatin, thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful lecture and we learned a lot from that. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Harsh and Pratik. Um, see, I, uh, I uh, would actually on the same lines, and before I move on to other observations, is say that goniosynicolysis really in our eyes, at least, uh, you know, dark irides. I know there are dark irides in, uh, in China as well as in Singapore, but 
there is intense inflammation, which unfortunately leads to further uh, pass formation. So I abandoned this procedure pretty early on. Uh, and, um, you know, looking at the results, of course, uh, you have not thought of, uh, you know, reinstating that in my surgical armamentarium. But what I wanted to know is what do you feel about um, endocycloplasty? Okay, oh, we, we don't have one, uh, well, we have one, but we don't use it uh, much in our practice. But, you know, I think that, you know, there's a possibility of uh, shrinking the uh, surgery process and opening up the angle, okay? I mean, theoretically it, it happens and people have described it as well, but I think it's a short-term effect and, you know, it's not a long-term effect, but certainly like in very um, recalcitrant case of acute angle closure, people have described doing a, not endo, but uh, 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 external cyclophotoregulation. And so to, to, to pull the, uh, to shrink the surgery process, open up the angle, and then uh, doing a lens extraction. I mean, there been people have described this, yeah, but I, I suppose the short-term effect is there, but I think for long-term- in, think... in my limited experience, I have found it to be very, very useful, especially not just in primary uh, plateau iris syndrome, but in all varieties of uh, primary angle closure glaucoma, even when the angle is appears to be, you know, 360 degree closed with Sineke. Um, well, uh, combined, uh, combined with cataract? I combined with cataract. Uh, combined with cataract. Yeah, absolutely. Combined with cataract. And uh, I so have... You know, what is the I, of the cataract alone? No, that also I have now done. See, the, 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 the problem is uh, to be able to... Uh, uh, for want of a better word, sell a procedure to a patient, uh, you know, uh, such that they, uh, you know, uh, feel that the 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 feet, the ground under their feet is going to shift if you don't do anything which is sort of normal and accepted and routine. The moment you tell them that you know it is it is relatively new, there the problem starts arising. But I still feel, generally speaking, I'm doing it. Uh, you know, I there was a bit of brief period where I didn't have access to it. I have access to it again, and I feel that this is this is really working. If not anything else, it brings the medication down. If Possible. not anything else, yes, and you know, oh, well, 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 quite often yeah. Trap quite often does the same. I have looked at it, with, you know, uh, compared it with FACO trap as well, and you know, it's come out trumps in terms of complications and interventions for those complications. Uh, the uh, intraocular pressure uh, and the anti glaucoma medication remained more or less the same in the two groups. So you do 360 degrees or what? No, no, no. I don't do 360 degrees. I am a little concerned about hypotony, although no one actually has. Uh, published on hypotony uh, in ECP, but I do about, I would say, uh, two and a half quadrants. Through a phaco wound, I get about 30, 35 uh, ciliary processes. So that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I leave it at that. And I, I, I find that um, it, it works uh, pretty well. And of course, the, uh, it's not endocyclophotocoagulation as such. It is endocycloplasty, where you, uh, you burn the tip of the ciliary process, uh, opening up the the angle. Uh, we're diverging a little bit, but you know, I, I just wanted to uh, to to ask your opinion about that. One comment I wanted to make about the Eagle study, which you know, I obviously have uh, read the paper again and again, and uh, there are a few things that I've found that you know uh, trouble me. One is that in the paper, indentation gonioscopy data was missing in 243 out of 400 patients. That is a whopping 60%. So we are actually not talking about uh, very severe glaucoma, as you pointed out. There is no doubt. You know, what we are dealing with here is, is, is serious stuff. And second is that quality of life, you know, uh, in, in a patient who is, an, is essentially a hyperope, 50 plus, would be happy to get rid of glasses, isn't it? So that itself could influence the quality of life. What do you think about, uh, you know? Yes, 100%. Yeah, this quality of life is, of course, you know, if you have hyperopia and you remove the cataract, 
you know, uh, the lens. Of course, you know, some people will feel much happier, you know. And so that's probably the, 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 the real reason. And, and even the quality of life improvement, you can't quantify it in terms of words. You know? I mean, you ask, uh, you know, the, the authors, uh, well, how do you tell your patient your quality of life is better? In what way is it better? They can't, yeah. they can't quantify it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, uh, one last question from me before we move on to the attendees' questions is um, ASOCT versus GONIO. Do you think it's there to stay or GONIO is still the gold standard? Yeah, okay. I think, you know, there's no, it's not like a one or the other. I think it's complementary, okay? And just like, you know, your OCT of the macula is complementary to your clinical examination, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, uh, a lot of my retina colleagues don't even probably just look at the OCT now more than the clinical examination, you know, right? But this is how things evolve, right? Yeah. Okay. And certainly, I think, you know, it's very useful to document the angle closure also to show the patient and you can look at the lens, you can look at the iris and see the different contributions to the angle closure. I think it's useful in that respect, but it's certainly not a crucial that you must have it. Yeah, and you know, right. it certainly is- So Bonio is still the gold standard. Okay. I mean, it's, it's easiest, right? It's easiest. But let's face it, uh, most people do not do Gonio, number one, yes. including my, a lot of my colleagues. And even those who do, they don't know what they're do, do, looking at. So you might as well do it in DSMO City. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest here. Yeah. <laughs> true, true. Uh, however much we uh, emphasize on gonioscopy, it is not being done as much. And, you know, people just think that it's a, the glaucoma specialist, for, you know, uh, prerogative to do it. Yeah, I got patients who referred for gonio. Can you can imagine you people refer for gonio. Like, oh, okay. I can refer them too. And you know, my initial reaction always is, "Come on, this is this is a an examination technique. It's not, yeah. it's not uh, you know an opinion that I can give." So for anyway. people, I think definitely do a anti is much more useful than not doing anything at all. Yeah. Right, right, okay. So um, uh, moving on to the questions, we have a question regarding GSL where um, uh, an, uh, a budding ophthalmologist wants to know the pros and cons of just sweeping an iris repositor in the angle without a gonio lens versus GSL. I, I don't know. I mean, you could cause a lot of bleeding. You know? I mean, I think you could, it's quite delicate. You know, GSL is very light pressure. You, know? you just sweep. And cause a I don't dialysis or something, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't uh, recommend it. Yeah, very much a blind procedure. So uh, definitely not, I mean, not recommended. But uh, what about just holding the pupillary edge gently during irrigation aspiration and tugging it? I don't know. I, I don't do that. I don't. No. I mean, this you know, will cause a lot of inflammation, but I, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't do that. Yeah. Okay, fine. And um, the second question here is the, is the effect of iridoplasty reversible? Uh, it's not reversible, but I think after a after some time, the and the iris, um, the opening may, may, may recede. I mean, it may, it may be declined. So the effect may decline. It's not that it's reversible, it will decline. Yeah. And is it done in a single sitting or would you do it in multiple sittings? Oh, usually we do it single sitting. Single sitting, 360 degrees. Yeah. 360 degrees. Okay. Any questions from Dr. Yeah. Hart? Yeah. Uh, uh, Tin had asked about that prone darkroom test because a lot of yeah, our yeah, students yeah. are asked about that regularly. So uh, if they are asked that, uh, would you prefer to do any test to prove to the patient that yes, your iridotomy is a must? Uh, what test you would tell them? No, uh, I, we, I don't, we don't do dark room provocative tests in our hospital. We don't do it. Yeah. And the literature is very mixed. Some shows, some shows very useful, some shows no use at all. You know? And the ZEP study showed it was not used, no, no use at all. It was, they haven't published this, but they, 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 they looked at the dark room provocative. It was not um, um, predictive of angle opening uh, after LPI. It was not predictive of incidence of PAC, nothing. Yeah. So, they are going to publish this very soon. Yeah. So what tests you would tell them? If they say that only gonioscopy they are going to depend on or some parameters you would get them in with anterior segment OCT or anything else that their PACS should go for iridotomy? 
I, I will firstly, if they have Senike closure, PAS anywhere, I will recommend Aridoplast. Uh, oh, it's uh, a primary uh, angle closure suspect. There is no Senike at all. No, no. No elevation yeah. of pressure, no Senike at all. It's difficult. You can't almost can't, you can't almost can't predict, you know. But I would say that if it's 360 degrees of closure, I often will tell them probably go for the uh, Aridoplast. So, we, so we'll go by the things that you told them that if uh, they have a family. Extent. Extent of this thing and uh, the other things that if they need repeated dilatation, probably right. that is what they will answer. Yeah, fair enough. And There's another I, question. I'll just have one, one more question. You know, yes. uh, you discussed about the Z trial and the Singapore trial, and you said that the four percent and two percent and ten percent and five percent obviously, as yes, the hazard issues goes down. Uh, but one thing is sure that you know, if you do the PI. This, uh, there is a probability that patient uh, yeah. would land up in an angle closure glaucoma uh, over a period of time, but at least the acute angle closure will be avoided. You know, I haven't seen a single patient where the you know, PSCS, the PI was done and he has developed the acute angle closure and came to me with the uh, with the corneal edema and so on, so forth, very high trauma. No, you, you can, you can. I, uh, uh, I've seen plateau iris, you, you can. In my clinical practice, what I have seen is the acute angle closure happens in the acute on chronic situation where they already yes, have a happen. chronic glaucoma going on and then suddenly acutely their angle shuts down. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, that has been the maximum that I have seen. Um, anyway, there is, there is another question is uh, whether would uh, you would use a prostaglandin analog, analog before uh, FACO? Yeah, I mean, if the pressure is high and you just need to control the pressure for a while, I can certainly use anything to control the pressure. And then do the FACO. After the FACO, usually I'll stop the medication to see what's the uh, if uh, so this, how the goes. general all pervading feeling uh, around. Uh, you know, I try to fight against that uh, mindset that prostaglandin analogs should not be given before uh, cataract surgery because it gives rise to CME. Uh, I think the risk is pretty low. I mean, I, I mean it's definitely less than 1%. So. Yeah, so, you know. I mean, yeah, I mean, if you're very worried and, and you don't have to use it. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> we have alternatives. Okay. Uh, we have alternatives. But uh, mm -hmm. my practice, we definitely don't stop it. Yeah. Okay, okay. right. Unless you are sure you are going to produce a PC rent, then, then maybe. You uh, <laughs> situation. If you, if, you, if you have one, then you stop it. Yeah, sure. If you if you don't, then there is no need to. That's what I also feel. Okay, I think we will let you go. It's really, really late. We really thank you for your time. We had a wonderful, wonderful session. Uh, and we hope to meet again pretty soon. Thank you. It's been, it's been great fun. And good to see all my old friends. And hope to all the best for the COVID. And hope everybody is healthy and safe. And thank hope you. to meet again. Thank you. Same to you, Tim. Stay safe. Bye. 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 Uh, I want the hot seaters to hang around because we do have a little time and I'm going to uh, utilize that time to uh, assimilate both concepts of open angle as well or perception of open angle and angle closure in a particular case. So okay. let's, yes, okay. oh, please, thank you. you can, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> mm. So here we are. This is a, and can you see my uh, slides? Yes, oh, yeah. yes ma'am. Okay, this is a 40 year old axial myo. His refraction was minus six in the right eye, minus 6.5 in the left, with a vague brow ache and borderline IOP. He is a known bilateral long-standing partial optic atrophy of unknown etiology. Not known. I have seen him at age 40. It could be labors. I'm not sure. Had recent consultations with four different ophthalmologists in town. And he presented with the BCV of 2020 80. And his pressures were on Goldman Abdonation 22 and 23 in the right and left. In the slit lamp examination, this is what I saw. Who would like to comment about that slit lamp examination? First of all, 
um, you know, what I'm trying to show you is the depth. Does the depth correlate with an with a myope? Where you expect no, ma'am. It no, ma'am. Ma it's uh, ma it's ma shallow. shallow. You need to be able to pick this up unless you suspect that the AC is shallow, unless you suspect, what else am I showing you? What am I showing you with the yellow arrows? The, the forward of the iris. Of iris. Exactly, exactly. So what does that tell you? That the mechanism here is? Pupillary block. Pusing, pupillary pusing block. Mechanism. Relative pupillary block. It will be pupillary block only if there is total sign in it. Yeah. So this is called relative pupillary block, not just pupillary block. So then obviously the next next step is to do a peripheral iridotomy. No, 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 no. Gonium. Gonioscopy. Yes. yes. Okay. Indentation gonioscopy. So, most notably, he had bilateral shallow AC and the gonioscopy was done. And lo and behold, not only was it occludable, but he had two quadrants of synechi in the right eye and one quadrant in the left eye. And of course, he had temporal pallor in both eyes, which was uh, correlated with the history of the presenting uh, vision. So what would you like to do to now the patient has gone to four different ophthalmologists. I can't suddenly say, oh, you need a laser. This, you know, we are going to make a hole in your eye because you've got angle closure. Nobody has done it. Nobody has suspected it. Why have they not suspected? Can anyone no, tell Did the that? patient have any anterior segment signs like glaucoma flecken or did he have any no, other signs? No. No, 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 no. Why did, why was gonioscopy not done? Actually, of the four, oh, of how was the flap? Three did not, do ophthalm, did not do gonioscopy and one mm -hmm. had incorrect findings. Say that again. Ma, how was the van herix? That, does that matter now? I've done IOP, it here. IOP was controlled, man. They didn't suspect much on IOP. 22 the and AC was shallow. 22, 23 AC shallow. Um, being a myope, maybe they didn't suspect an angle closure. Exactly. Closer. We presume that you may not, you will not be shallow AC. And you will not have a relative pupillary block in myopia. But that is not true. That is not true at all. Okay. So what is important here is that you, sus your clinical suspicion with looking at the AC depth, A, and two, doing your gonioscopy. You will do a gonioscopy in a myo. And in any case, if the pressure is high or borderline, you would still do a gonioscopy. Okay, you will not skip that step. Remember, gonioscopy is indicated in a comprehensive examination when the peripheral anterior chamber depth is less than equal to one fourth CT, when the pressure is borderline or is high. Okay, when there are signs of secondary glaucoma, all these issues, um, you know, all these conditions should have gonioscopy done. Okay, so what did I need to do? You already had this lecture to prove that the patient had angle closure. Gonioscopy. Done. I can't show the gonioscope results to the patient. What do I need to do? ASOCT. Disc evaluation. ASOCT does not look beyond the iris. Please remember, we don't have such good machines yet. They do cost money. What do you do? You're in the on the correct lines. UBM. UBM. Yes. And what will you see on UBM? Okay, UBM was done. So, what will you see on UBM? What have What have I pointed out here? A forward movement of the ciliary body complex. With from the part of ciliary body. This is your ciliary body. I'll come to that later. Iris lenticular contact. And yes, irido lenticular contact. contact. This is where relative pupillary block occurs. But what tells you that relative pupillary block has occurred? What is the this? Bowing of the iris. Okay, bowing of the iris. What is this? What is this? The posterior chamber. Yes, shallow. posterior chamber is formed. Okay, and that this one, top one is your right eye, bottom one is your left eye. 
Okay, so not only did I did I do UVM before, I showed it to him that this is your angle closure, but after the laser was done, here, right eye, here, left eye, repeated the UVM, you can see the ciliary processes are anterior. So you can't see that very, very clearly here, but ciliary processes anterior, iridociliary sulcus is absent, and there is a little bit of lens vault. Lens vault is slightly more on the left side. So he has three mechanisms of angle closure. We eliminated, can you see posterior chamber is no longer visible? Posterior yes, chamber is no longer yes, visible. So relative pupillary block has been eliminated by? PI. By PI, okay. And post PI, you are seeing signs of plateau iris syndrome. What are those signs? Most important are anteriorly placed ciliary processes ciliary and loss of iridociliary sulcus with continued angle closure. Of course, here you're also seeing signs of lens vault. Okay, so whenever the pressure is high, does not matter if it's a myo. So why, why do you think, what is the mechanism? I will end by explaining to you the mechanism. Tell me, what can be the mechanism of, sorry. Can anyone explain to me? Maybe patient underwent frequent dilatation or uh, this uh, was mm -hmm. or so That that uh, does not cause um, uh, is not the reason why the patient is predisposed to angle closure. Patient may develop angle closure if the AC is shallow and you are dilating repeatedly. Okay, that's that's a separate issue. Not I what I'm my mom family history. No, I mean myops. The posterior part of the eyeball. Uh, elongates, but the anterior part is uh, very crowded. good. Excellent answer. I did not expect it. Who was that? Tanmay? Yes, ma'am. Excellent answer. The vitreous length is more relative to the anterior chamber. Okay, anterior segment. That is why you can have, be an axial myope and still be have or have angle closure. There is a study which says up to 9% or maybe slightly more of angle closures, uh, sorry, of axial myopes can have uh, angle closure, relative pupillary block. I'm uh, extremely, extremely uh, impressed with your answer, Tanma. I did not expect it at all. Okay, on that note, I think we can say good night. Yeah, we'll come back with further questions when time permits. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Take care. Good night.